16. <clears throat> the last time I spoke, I was still, <coughs> you know, and I'm so grateful. Uh, I am almost completely recovered. A few little <coughs> every once in a while, but not much. So, um, excuse me. As, as Steve, you know, we, we get up here and we start whenever it gets warm, doesn't it? It surely does. So um, we're going to turn to the word of the Lord this morning. We're going to be so encouraged by what we read in, uh, and what we talk about this morning in Acts 16. If you'll remember, um, those, uh, it's been about a month or so now. We were uh, talking about Paul and Silas, Luke and Timothy, the ministry team uh, being called to Philippi, to, being called to the area of Macedonia Today, Macedonia would be the area that we know as Greece. So um, they go, and as I was thinking, uh, uh, this morning you heard uh, an invitation again to go to uh, Cambodia on a missions trip, and I was thinking about that because I already know what I'm speaking about this morning. I thought, that's very much uh, like, uh, like Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke as they were called and they saw uh, Paul had a dream in the night or a vision in the night somebody from Macedonia we don't know what indicated that but he's from Macedonia and he begged them please come over here Paul and Silas are not told exactly where to go they choose Philippi they're not even told exactly what they're going to do but God opens the door step by step as they go brothers and sisters God will seldom, will seldom give you a five-year plan with all the details of what he wants you to do. But he will call us, and he is looking for those who are obedient. He's looking for those who will say, yes, God, here am I. He's looking for those who will take a step. And you may only know the first step, but you know we're so human. We want to know, well, what, what's next, what's next, what's next, right? We want it all figured out. God doesn't usually do that. God usually calls us. He's looking for a step of obedience, and then as we obey, just the, just the very first step, God will open more doors, and God will lead us into the things that he has for us. And that's what we see with uh, Paul and Silas, Luke and Timothy. So we were looking, uh, uh, we, we, we said we we're going to look at three uh, Christians, three who become Christians in Philippi, in this great city that's a Roman colony. Were there other Christians? You bet. There were many, many who came to the Lord, but the Holy Spirit has chosen Luke to highlight three people who become Christians, and I believe we're going to meet all of them in heaven one day all of them and it's going to be wonderful and you're going to meet them and you're going to say I read about you um, and uh, and they're going to say and we've been waiting for you when we make it to heaven the first one was Lydia and as we think about this call of God uh, they enter the city of Philippi and I don't want to um, I want to go quickly through the just the review and then we're going to keep on going this morning because we're going to finish up chapter 16 but uh, the only person, the only thing that is actually planned among these three people is Lydia, the very first one. They go, uh, they choose to go, okay, there's no synagogue there, so they decide we will go out to the river and we're sure that there will be some Jews who believe in the one true God. They don't know about Jesus yet, but they'll be out by the river. There was no synagogue because there weren't uh, enough Jewish men in the city to have a synagogue. Had to have a minimum of ten. Um, so they go out, they plan to go out by the river, and sure enough, there is a group there. But Lydia is not, <clears throat> excuse me, Lydia is not even Jewish. She is just a proselyte. She believes in, in the one true God, in Judaism, and she's the first person um, to hear the word of God. And the Bible says, uh, the Lord opened her ears to hear, and she received. And we talked about that, um, that, that very first response. What does Lydia do? Immediately, she's baptized. Her family, her household believes also, and they are baptized. So those of you, if you have become a Christian and you've not yet been baptized, you, might, you may be thinking, how is it that every time we come to baptism, Pastor Jennifer is preaching, her sermon happens to be about baptism. I think it's the Holy Spirit, don't you? Um, and, and we have baptism coming up, but if you are born again, and you have not yet made personally the decision to be baptized in water, you should be baptized May 1st. 
and, and as we see here, so Lydia is baptized. What's the very next thing we see her do? The very next thing we see is that she opens up her heart and there is a blessing and a gift of hospitality to Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy. They would have been staying in an inn that would have been almost like a brothel. It would have been a terrible place, an awful place for Christian men, for any Christian to stay. And so she says, if you really think I'm born again, come, live in, uh, come stay with me. She was a woman of means and um, had certainly had the, the, uh, the uh, ability to take care of them and to provide hospitality. What I want to say this morning as we look at this and as we go on is this. When salvation comes to a person, there is fruit. There is fruit. There's always fruit. There is no secret salvation that is unknown to anybody else. Now I know if you're in North Korea for example or some, or, or, or some other country like that um, there you have to be you would have to be very careful you couldn't go around saying I'm born again and go out by the river and be and be uh, uh, baptized openly but the point is this for, for, for people for all of us when somebody is born again there should be fruit. Salvation brings fruit in a person's life. And I want to tell you, if somebody says, I am born again, I have become a Christian, but we see no fruit in their lives, no fruit according to the Bible, then you might want to, you might want to evaluate again, is this person truly born again? And in our own lives as well, when salvation comes, there will be fruit. And we see that with Lydia. Okay, so the second one we meet is the slave girl. And I want you to think for just a minute, in that, in those days especially, um, women generally did not have a very high position in society, especially in Jewish, especially in Jewish society, but in Philippi, women generally did. And so the very first person, very first Christian we meet is Lydia, a very wealthy woman. The second person we meet who's going to become a Christian is a demon-possessed slave girl. And I love that the Holy Spirit has highlighted these two because they're so far apart, aren't they? At one end of the spectrum, a wealthy businesswoman who has everything. At the other end of the spectrum, a young, a child, a slave girl who is demon-possessed, who has nothing. She's a slave. Everything she has is owned by others. She doesn't even have freedom. And she has no, even no peace in her heart because of, because of the demon possession. And we see this picture of what God does in lives. He reaches the highest of the high and the lowest of the low and everybody in between. Nobody is left out. I, I, to me, this is interesting too, as we look at as we consider again this call to evangelism and to missions in Cambodia this morning, I like what Kim said, we're, we're just going. I feel like I, there's, there's not even really a, a plan. We're going to do this, 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 and this. And I want you to look if, you look, if you have your Bibles with you, if we look at the slave girl, at what happens when Paul um, interacts with this slave girl, he had no plan to interact with this slave girl that day. The Bible says they were going on the way to prayer and this slave girl is following them and he just turns around and he says, and he commands the demon, the demon to leave the girl and the demon leaves the girl and she is saved. Uh, we talked about this last time, you say, but it doesn't say that she was saved. Of course she was saved. Paul would never cast a demon out of someone and then just say, okay, good luck for you, go on your own way, right? <laughs> of course not, of course not. Um, God gives us our brains, so we use them. And, and here's this beautiful picture of they're going about their business and God brings a ministry opportunity. You and I, there will be times in our lives when we plan ministry, when we, we, we have it organized, we're going to do this. But brothers and sisters, there will be other times when you just go about your daily business. You go about the work that you have. You get up and you go to your office. You get up and you go to your classroom. You, you do what you're doing. You're with your family. And the Lord will bring opportunities your way. If you are ready, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to care and to love, God will bring people your way and they need His love and they need His help and He's going to use you. 
And so she is delivered of this demon. And now I want us to see what happens next. Here's the heartlessness of those who are controlled by greed and love of money. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar. They're telling us to do things that are not, uh, that are not lawful for us to do. So the only thing they care about this girl is that they can't make money from her anymore. May I say to you that that's the heart of the enemy? That's the heart of the enemy. The only thing he cares about in grabbing people and making them his own is what he can have from them. That's, that's all he cares about. That's all he cares about. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have abundant life. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And so they make this claim and they say, oh, they're Jews. I want to say something to you this morning. I was thinking about this as I was meditating, as we were singing, and as we were worshiping. When I read this again, I thought, huh, I've heard that before. Uh, many of you know that for about 10 years, I was north of the border and um, had many students. And whenever I would talk about Jesus or whenever I would talk about being a Christian, almost every time someone would say to me, and those of you who were north of the border would say, would, would say you've heard this before as well, I would be told, oh, Christianity, that's a Western religion. Right? Have you heard that before? Sure. That's a Western religion. May I say something to you this morning? That is not a cultural thing at its heart. At its heart, that's the work of the enemy. The work of the enemy will always push to say, that's not for us. That's for somebody else. That's for somebody else. It's not part of our culture. That's from the devil. That's from the devil. It's not from God. And as we come to this, I, 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 as I was thinking about this, I thought, for us as Christians, we want to make sure that our cultures and our customs don't cause anybody to stumble when we talk about Jesus, but never let somebody, never let them live with the belief, oh, that's for other people. That's for Westerners. That's for whatever. That's not for me. Christianity and Jesus is the culture of heaven. It's the culture of heaven, and it's for everyone. What does Paul write a little bit later? He said, I have trans we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Brothers and sisters, although God has put us has, has let us be born into different countries and to different cultures and we're grateful for those things and we're thankful for those things. In the end, there are only two cultures. There's the culture of darkness and of this world and there's the culture of heaven. And Jesus has come that we might have life that we might have life. Make sure when you share with people that you bring them not your culture, although we are from different cultures, make sure you bring them Jesus. Make sure you bring them Jesus. And the accusation here that they make is, oh, these men are Jews. Let me say something else as well. As we look around uh, Lighthouse with all of our colors and all of our skin and all of our languages and all of these differences that we are, be thankful for the countries into which you were born and your ethnicity, but never let those things be ahead of being a Christian. You and I are Christians first. We're Christians first. We are not Ugandan, Sierra Leonean, American, Chinese, Filipino, German, British, any of these things. We are not these things first. First, we are children of God. We're children of God. Never, ever, ever let culture and ethnicity, and Cambodian, <laughs> never, and I'm sure there are more, sorry. I know I'm missing some right now. Never, ever, ever let ethnicity separate you and divide you from the work of God. We're Christians first. We're Christians first. The crowd joins in the attack. Uh, that's what the devil always does. They join in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates, the police officers, order them to be stripped and beaten. 
we talked about this before, but for Philippi, the, some of the benefits of being Roman citizens, remember we talked about this, the right uh, of voting, the right to own land, um, the, and all sorts of other rights, but one of the other rights was freedom from beating and freedom from imprisonment before trial. But perhaps in the uproar and perhaps in the riot, they're not able to say, hey, wait, 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 we're Roman citizens, you can't do this to us. Instead, what happens? They were severely flogged. What about Timothy and what about Luke? Well, Timothy and Luke were clearly Greek or Roman, right? And Timothy would have been very young also. So Timothy and Luke perhaps escaped the crowd because they didn't look Jewish and didn't seem Jewish. But Paul and Silas had been severely flogged and they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And it's in such a circumstance that we meet the third Christian, the third Christian. It's going to be the jailer, and we already know this. He's a very good jailer, by the way. Notice that? Have you ever met a civil servant that is, don't really say anything, but you can nod your head. Sometimes, sometimes civil servants are mm, troublesome, right? All of us would say that. This is an excellent civil servant. He receives instructions, and he put them in the inner cell. They said, guard them carefully, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. So let's look at that for just a little bit. Roman prisons had three sections. I had to look for a while to find this, uh, to find this picture because most of the pictures showed uh, windows and this and that, but that is not where pa Paul and Silas were put. Roman prisons had three sections. There was the outer section, and the outer section had windows and ventilation and some outside light. Then there was a middle section that was more enclosed, but there was still some ventilation. And then there was the inner prison. And the inner prison had no ventilation, no plumbing of any sort, and no lights. Paul and Silas were put in the inner prison. You can imagine what it must have been like. You can imagine what the floor must have been like. And then they were put in stocks as well. And all, I, I, I looked also to try to find some stocks and I didn't find any pictures good enough for that. Um, but we've all seen stocks before, right? These wooden things or sometimes, especially if it's a British or early American, you know, you, it'll show them with a piece of wood like this, you know, and the, their heads will be like that. Uh, Roman stocks were much worse than that. And they were designed not only to keep them secure, but to cause more torture. And so Paul and Silas are severely beaten, they're bleeding, they're seated probably on the floor or in such a way with the stocks so that they are suffering. They've not received any help and, it, and they're suffering as well. And this is the condition. So I wanna ask you something. How are Paul and Silas going to have an opportunity now we already know the rest of the story, but I want you to think about this if, as if we didn't know this story. How are Paul and Silas going to have any opportunity to speak to this jailer or to have their message with any credibility? Here they are, bruised, beaten, bloody, probably sitting in human waste right now. That's what it would have been like in the inner prison. How are they going to share the gospel? with this person that God wants them to reach. I ask you that question because this morning a lot of us also think at times I would like to share the gospel with other people but I can't. My circumstances don't allow it. I would if I could but I'm not allowed to. I would if I could, but I can't speak to my employer, for example. Probably some of you before have tried to tell your employers or your bosses or your students or others about Jesus, and you have been told, I don't want to hear that, or don't talk to me about that. And we look at these things, or we look at our situations, and we feel and we think, I am bound. I can't say anything. My circumstances limit me. 
Let us learn from Paul and Silas this morning. Nothing can stop the good news of Jesus. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Don't let the devil lie to you and don't believe his lie that your circumstances prevent you from showing the goodness of God and the love of God. How, how can I say that? Let's see what comes next. About midnight. I like it. I like that the Holy Spirit inspires Luke to write about midnight. Worst time of the night, right? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Chains never limit God's people. Prisons never limit God's people. The worst circumstances of our lives never limit God's people or God's message. In fact, brothers and sisters, may I say to you that sometimes the very things we loathe, sometimes the very things that we beg, oh God, get me out of this. Sometimes the very valleys that we're going through and we're saying, oh God, deliver me, are the vehicles by which God is going to show His glory, His love, and His salvation. Amen? Amen. 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 And so here they are, inner prison. And Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. But I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you. Some of you right now are struggling with some very serious things. Or you have been. And you're, maybe you're just coming out of them. But you think, oh God, get me out of this. Oh God, deliver me. And instead, God may be planning to do something different. May I say to you, in your prison, in your darkness, in your stocks, and in your chains, this is what God will do. The Lord will send His faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. Amen. Amen. Let that verse encourage you this morning. You may be in chains. You may be in the prison. What is God going to do? His song will be with you in the night. His song will be with you. And when you open your heart to the song of God, and when you and I choose, God, I'm going to give you a sacrifice of praise in this circumstance. It is a sacrifice of praise. His song will lift you up and encourage you. Unfortunately, a lot of us in the night, in the prison, in the chains, and in the stocks, our song sounds something like this. Oh, God. Where are... Well, I should be singing, right? Where are you, God? You have forsaken me. Oh. I could go on and on, but let's not, since this is going to be on YouTube, okay? <laughs> I should have planned the song a little bit better, right? <laughs> but honestly, brothers and sisters, and believe me, I am not pointing a finger at you. I've done it myself. Our, what The song that comes from us is, is rather a, a dirge of complaint, isn't it? Oh, God, where are you? God, what's going on? Let God send you His song to be with you in the night, and it's a prayer to the God of my life. It's a prayer to the God of your life. The, pre the, j the jail, the prisoner, the stocks do not control your life or my life if we are children of God. He is the God of our lives. He is the God of our lives. And Paul and Silas are singing. You know, I was thinking about that. <clears throat> I can imagine what their prayers were like. I wonder what our prayers would be like. I wonder what our songs would be like in similar circumstances. We might be saying, God, you're the one that told me to come to Philippi. Look what has happened to me, <laughs> right? We probably would, right? A lot of, uh, we, we accuse God very, very well. I want to remind you, I was thinking about this yesterday. If you think back all the way to the Old Testament, there was another godly man 
who was following God, who was thrown in prison, also unjustly, because Paul and Silas have been beaten and they've been thrown in prison through no fault of their own. They haven't done anything wrong, and they're in prison unjustly. Can you think of another uh, person in the Old Testament who was suffering in prison, unjustly accused? There you go, Joseph. And I encourage you to, be a, to become a student of the Word of God. If you go back and read about the life of Joseph, about five times in the life of Joseph, it says, God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. There's only one time when it says something different. Do you know what it says in one time in his life? It says, God was with Joseph and showed him his faithful love or his faithfulness. God shows, showed his faithful love. Do you know when that was? That was when Joseph was in prison, in Potiphar's prison. Brothers and sisters, God is with us in our prisons, and God will do something, as he did for Paul and Silas. So they were in prison, they were praying, they were singing hymns to God, and I don't want you to miss these last few words. And the other prisoners were listening to them. I would love to always preach a message or always preach a gospel here in the church. People come to church, they sit down, and I preach a sermon from my notes. But you know what, brothers and sisters? The people that most need God often will not come through those doors, will they? If you invite them, they will sometimes curse and say, get out of here, no way, I don't want to whatever. Yeah, I've heard about you Christians before. The people that most need God, many of them will never darken the doors of this church. How was God going to reach a jailer, an official of the Roman government? How was God going to reach the prisoners who are in that jail. As I was thinking about this, I remembered something that um, I think Pastor Renee would remember it as well. Many years ago, we were north of the board. We were north of the border, and we were with a group of dear brothers and sisters, many of whom had been imprisoned. The pastor had been imprisoned. I don't know if you remember, maybe 17 times. He'd been imprisoned maybe 17 times and more, and so had the people in his group and in his congregation. And when we gathered with them, and I'm not giving the details, for, even though this was quite a long time ago, I think this maybe was in the late 80s or early 90s, we were with the group that were there, and they were telling us about their imprisonment just a few months earlier. I think they'd been out only about three months or something like that. But the whole group of them had been imprisoned, and quite a few of the women, and young women, I mean, some of them were still in their teens, they had also been imprisoned. And there were 16 women, I think, or I, I don't remember how many, I, I, Pastor Renee re may remember now. Anyhow, all, all of the women had been arrested also and then imprisoned. And they were in prison for about 16 days um, in a cell with many other women. And in those days, the 16 days that they were in prison, they led every single female prisoner in that cell with them to salvation. Every one of them. Every one of them. Brothers and sisters, how is God going to reach people like that? Now that was a physical jail cell. Um, this is a physical jail cell. The, the story I just told you, it was a physical jail cell. But there are plenty of people that you and I meet every day who are imprisoned. Do you know what I mean? They're imprisoned. How, how is God going to reach them? How is God going to show them His love? May I say to you this morning that for some of these people, the only way they're going to see Jesus the only way they're going to see the salvation of Jesus, the only way they're going to be shown God's love, is if a child of God is also in that prison with them. Is if 
a child of God goes through the same valley that they are going through. We would never want to do that. And, and I want to use Rose in his, as an example. Sorry, Rose on the back row. Because we all know the struggle that she has gone through and the battle that she and Steve have faced in these last few years. And God didn't bring cancer. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. That's from the devil. But God can use it for His glory. How could I talk to somebody about the love of God and the mercy of God as they face cancer? I haven't faced cancer. I haven't gone through that. But Rose has. Steve has faced it with his wife. Is it possible that God in His love and in His mercy allows us to go through some of these things that are so, so hard that He might reach people who would otherwise never be reached. Some of you are in horrible work situations now. Some of you are in high pressure situations. Some of you are facing financial difficulties when your last pennies are being squeezed. How can somebody who has everything and has never worried about where their next meal come from talk to somebody else about God will provide for you, God will take care of your needs? It's going to be somebody who's struggling themselves with their pocketbooks right now. And so brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you as I was, as I was preparing, there were other things that I, that I that I wanted to, to talk about. We're still going to talk a little bit more. This more than anything was the message that the Holy Spirit spoke to me this morning. God wants to reach people in difficult circumstances and a lot of times He is looking for His faithful children who are also going through those circumstances but going through it not moaning and groaning like the rest of the world but praying to God and singing hymns at midnight at midnight, at midnight. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. I wonder why all the prisoners don't immediately escape. Because they're free now. The doors are open. The chains have come off. Why don't they, why don't they go running away? Why? Do you suppose it's because of two men who were singing praises to God and hymns to God and praying to God in that prison? I'm pretty sure. The jailer woke up. That's because the jailer's home would have been, it would have been, uh, the home would have been nearby and then the jailer would have been in the outside part. And when he saw the prison doors were open, he draws his sword. He's going to kill himself. He's going to commit suicide. Why is he going to do that? Because if a prisoner, if a Roman prisoner escaped, whatever judgment that prisoner was going to have would be heaped upon the jailer and he would be tortured and then he would be put to death. That was the, that was the uh, 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 punishment for allowing prisoners to escape. So he's a really good civil servant. He's a really good jailer. He says, I'm going to kill myself instead. And Paul calls out, Paul shouted out, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Now I was reading some scholars and, and some people were saying, how does Paul know that they're all there? There's no light inside. Oh my goodness. Seriously? <laughs> They're all there. And so, what happens next? Doesn't this remind you of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament? Doesn't it remind you of Daniel and the lion's den? It surely does. Why? Because it's the, it's the same God. It's the same God. And Paul says, don't harm yourself. We are all here. What happens next? The jailer calls for lights. Paul already knew everybody was there. The jailer has to make sure, right? So in come the lights, and he rushes in, and he falls trembling before Paul and Silas. What must I do to be saved? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How is God going to reach a jailer who's putting people in jail and imprisoning people? He's going to have to get two faithful servants in the prison, and he knows he can trust Paul and Silas to pray and sing praises to God and give a good testimony that God is good whether they're in prison or outside of the prison. God is good whether their bodies are bruised and broken or whole. God is good whether they're suffering or they're not 
not suffering. God is a good God. And the jailer, amen, amen. And the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Oh, what's, what a turnaround. Here's somebody who's been, in, who's been imprisoning people, and now he himself says, what must I do to be saved? And they reply, simple, believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. Because his house is nearby. Oh, God always wants to save a whole family. Did you know that? So if you're the only Christian in your family, hang in there. Keep praying. Keep living for God. God's plan is always to save a whole family. Never just one out of a family. Amen. And so they speak the word of the Lord to him, to all the others in his house, and they can speak with authority. What did I ask you before? How is their message going to have any, any uh, resonance with this jailer when they're sitting there in squalor and in chains? God's going to show himself. And you may be sitting, sitting in squalor and in chains, but you hang in there and you pray to God and you sing hymns to him with your life and God is going to show himself in your life and in my life as well. And at that hour of the night, he takes them, he takes them to his home, he washed their wounds. Oh, again, hospitality, right? Again, hospitality. But even before anything else, what happens? Baptized. Have you been baptized in water yet? This is the pattern. I, hey, I didn't plan this this Sunday. This is, this is here, okay? This is God speaking to you. And then he brought them to his house and set a meal before them. Here's this hospitality again. And I love this. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God. He and his whole family. Salvation always has fruit. Salvation always has fruit. And here's an overflow of joy. An overflow of joy. I believe our salvation has come to my house. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so the next morning comes. Uh, what about Paul and Silas? Do they go on their way? Do they stay at their house? No. He's a very good civil servant. They are still prisoners of the Roman government. They have to go back to jail, right? And so they go back to jail. So what? You say, huh? Yes. Yes. We follow the laws of the land. And so, um, oops, let's see. Whoa, let me back up. Let me back up. Oh, I think I've missed something. Hang on. I've, I've, wait just a minute. Ah, uh, okay. Imagine with me. You have the Bible, right? Um, when the morning comes, I've missed that, I missed that slide. When the morning comes, uh, the magistrates say, okay, release them. Now, they're, they're okay to go. And so the jailer says, hey, you can go. And Paul and Silas say, no way, Jose, right? No way. What? We are Roman, we're Roman citizens. You want us to, to slink off in secrecy? No way. They want us to leave this prison? Tell them to come themselves and release us. Now what's happening here, brothers and sisters? Paul and Silas suddenly get very arrogant, right? Is that, that's what, it, admit it, that's what you and I have thought before when we read that, right? All of a sudden they, they got really on their high horse? No, that's not what happens. Um, when the city officials find out they're Roman citizens, they realize we have broken the law. We can get in big trouble for this. And so they came to the jail and they apologize. And this time they say, and please leave our city. <laughs> please leave our city. Why do they say this? It would cause great trouble if it were known that they had beaten Roman citizens and they had put them in prison without a trial. Why do Paul and Silas do this? And, I, and, and, and I, this is important for us as we, as we come to the end. Why do they do this? Paul and Silas were Christians. The accusation against them had been against Christians. And if Paul and Silas slink out of the jail and depart, Christianity in this new city would be under a cloud. And they don't want there to be any cloud over Christianity. They want to make sure things are clear. And so they say, no, it's got to be done the right way. And so they come and they apologize. Please leave the city. And so Paul and Silas leave the prison. They return to the home of Lydia. Remember what I told you at the very beginning? With Lydia's show of hospitality to the team, she had the privilege of housing the church that is most beloved by Paul in the New Testament. Did you know that? It is Paul's, you say we shouldn't have favorites. Guess what? 
The Philippian church was Paul's favorite church. It was his favorite bunch of believers. He loved them and they loved him. He never wrote to them, now you should, you shouldn't, whatever you should. No, it was, I love you. Whenever I think of you, I remember you with joy. Thank you for sharing in the gospel with me. It was a love relationship and Lydia got to be the host of that church. And it started out with a show of hospitality and then they left town. But they encouraged them because they needed encouragement, didn't they? Paul and Silas had been thrown in prison. And then some years later, I want us to think back as we, as we close very quickly this morning. I want, to, I want us to be good students of the Bible. About 11 years later, Paul writes the letter to Philippians back to this church. And I challenge you, go back and read Philippians and think about this church. Think about who's in this church. Lydia is in this church. The slave girl that was demon possessed is in this church. The jailer is in this church. And I can guarantee you some of the, some of the prisoners, right? I can guarantee you they're in this church. And so he writes this letter and this is what we close with. He writes and he says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. I pray for you with joy because you have your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And in that group, Lydia whispers, God, thank you that you let me be the first Christian and I got to be a partner with Paul. And then Paul writes, forgetting what is behind. See, it's still Philippians. And straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. And in that church, a young woman closes her eyes and in gratefulness says, Oh, thank you, God. I forget my past. I used to be a demon-possessed slave girl. But now I'm free. Now I'm free. And I push forward as well. And then Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. As a result, the whole palace guard, because Paul was in prison again when he wrote this, the whole palace guard and everyone else knows that I'm in chains for Christ. And in that group, the jailer laughs and says, same old Paul. <laughs> He's still reaching civil servants. And then Paul writes that passage that we know so well. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evidence to all. The Lord is near. And what does it say? Don't be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. And in that group, there are former prisoners who would say, Amen. We heard Paul and Silas do just that. We were groaning and cursing. And Paul and Silas were saying, Thank you, God. You're still a good God. Oh, Lord, we look to you, the Lord of our lives. Brothers and sisters, there's so much, there's so much we can learn from these Philippian Christians, isn't there? It's not ancient history, but there's something for you and there's something for me here this morning. If we are going through a tough time, hang in there, hang in there, pray and sing praises to God in your midnight and he will send his song to you to accompany you. Hang in there. Hang in there. May our lives be lives of testimony, just as the Philippian church will. Let's close in prayer this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Oh, God, some of us have not been saying thank you. We have been groaning in our chains in our prison. And, Lord, some of us, we confess, we've been kind of complaining, maybe not outwardly, but in our hearts, and, and saying, why, God, it's not fair. But Lord, this morning, we say, as Paul and Silas said, we, you are good, you are God. We're singing to you because you are the Lord of our lives. You're the God of our lives. Lord, we look beyond ch prisons. We look beyond chains. We look beyond darkness. We look beyond unjust treatment. And we see that our lives are in your hands and nothing can stop us. 
and nothing can keep us chained, for you are the God of our lives. Lord, we sing praises to you. Lord, open our eyes to see how we might show your glory in our lives and your goodness to others around us who are going through similar things. Lord, we've been so focused on ourselves that we, have, we haven't even considered those that are going through these things and they don't have the joy and the hope of knowing you. But Lord, this morning we exalt you in our lives, we lift you up and we say you are good, you are God, and Father, whether you send an earthquake or an angel, we're still going to praise you, we're going to to look to you. We're going to glorify you with our lives. And Lord, we say that we will sing praises to you. Lord, we will call out to you and your peace will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. You will surround us with your love. And Lord, we ask that as you take us through times that are not easy, Lord, we pray that you will open our hearts and open our eyes and open our mouths that we might share you with others and bring others along with us that they might come to know your salvation just as that jailer did and just as other prisoners did and just as the demon possessed slave girl did and just as Lydia did. Oh God if people were to write to us here in Lighthouse may we have some of the same wonderful testimonies that we read this morning that we read of here this morning as we think of these beloved brothers brothers and sisters in Philippi. Oh God, we praise your name. We look to you. You are our God. You are our Lord in the prison or, out or in the palace. You are our God in daylight or in darkness. We look to you, our God, and we honor you with our lives, with our words, with our attitudes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.